You're going to be a good boy. There's not a lot of tail lagging and looking expectantly at me. He's never a good boy when we're in here. You're going to hang out and be in the podcast? You look guilty. Why do you look guilty? Because he's farting up a storm, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are again. Here we are. Episode three. Episode three. This is take two for us because we sat down last time and the minute we did, the neighbour started cutting his grass. <laughs> and then got the streamer out and it was super loud. Yeah. And we've had to wait like an hour and a half. Such a long time. The longest anyone's taken to cut their grass. But ever. I think I think starting again will be better. I think so. Because you won't have to listen to just a gentle boom in the background. <laughs> which is what everybody wants. Well, this is the Generally Spooky podcast. Yes, it is. And you are currently listening to episode three of three of our witchcraft miniseries. I have thoroughly enjoyed it so far. Really? First two episodes have been excellent. Aww, I'm glad you enjoyed them. I'm excited to hear this one. The roundup. The this, finale. This might be the best one. Ooh. The other two were great and they were super interesting, but th- even if this one isn't the best one, it's the most bizarre of the three stories. I mean, I'm here for that. It's going to be even weirder than Isabel Gowdy's confessions. <laughs> but but that was next level weird. I know, I know. And this is beyond that. Her just gabbing away about witchcraft shite. <laughs> Odin just jumped into Kieran's lap. <laughs> he did. Go away. <laughs> You're fine. You don't need anything. He's totally happy. He just needs attention. Yeah, he's just a souk. Well, yeah, this is, this is the strangest story, I think. Well, I'm excited. I want to get into it. I can't wait. Well, yeah, this this story isn't like anything that we've really covered before. Like, in the podcast at all. Not even just in the miniseries. Oh, well, that's exciting. It's, it's just completely different and completely unique. And I was completely hooked on this whole story while I was doing my research. Ooh. And that I even had to talk to you at one point and just verbalize how confused and baffled I was. <laughs> you did. <laughs> like you, you still don't know the details. I didn't tell you anything, but I was so confused I couldn't keep it in. <laughs> and there's the crying. And right on cue. Please hold. The dog has been put to his bed. (laughs) Yep. Peace reigns. Yes. No strimmer. No dog. No crying. No stomping feet. Should should I go? I'm quite noisy. Yeah, I think you should probably go. Yeah, okay. I'll see you guys later. Ooh. Listen to the sound effects. (laughs) (laughs) Sounded so genuine. Well, like I was saying, super strange, super bizarre, super interesting. Yes. This is the story of Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan. The woman made famous for supposedly being the last Scottish witch. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a guess at when this story takes place? Well, I want to say like 16 something. But I think I saw a Wikipedia page you had open while you were doing your research that mentioned one of the world wars. Hmm. So, and I just kind of glanced across that and went, what? And then didn't look further into it because I knew you were researching. (laughs) Well, the bulk of the story happens in the 1930s and 40s. Oh, wow. Which, when we're talking about the last witch in Britain, in Scotland, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. Jeez, hell. Mm -hmm. That is so contemporary. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're seriously jumping through history this episode. Damn. And we're landing at a time when almost the entire world is at war. Yeah. So that's fun. And there's just a witch cracking around. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Oh, well, this should be interesting. Are you, are you excited? I am excited. Because I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm very curious. Just how? What? Why? I need details. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first off. Okay. Get this. Yeah. Helen Duncan was born on the 25th November 1897. Yep. As Victoria... Helen McRae Duncan. Ho ho! Can't trust a McRae. That's exactly what I have in my notes. 
<laughs> McCrees are fucking shady. Yeah. I'm a McCree, if anyone doesn't know. Isn't that strange? That is very strange. That's the second or third time that I've come across a McCree in all my research for stories. Yeah, there was one of the Loch Ness Monster, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. He was a priest who was convinced that he saw a monster in a West Coast loch. Yeah. Hmm. And now there's technically another one. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. I have seen other places that say that her maiden name was McFarlane, but I, I don't know. When this happens, I don't know what to believe when yeah. there's multiple sources. It's better. I, I can only go so deep. It's better for our story that she's a McCree. Well, exactly. So we can just lean into that. Exactly. So Helen was born in Callander, which is in Perthshire. Yep. And it's a beautiful part of the country. And I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew this. But Callander is just south of something called the Highland Boundary Fault. Have you heard of that before? No, I don't think so. How I didn't know that this existed, I don't know. But this is literally the the physical boundary between the Highlands and the Lowlands. Huh. Like, it, it physically marks a change in the landscape and geology of Scotland. I had no idea. Me neither. Maybe because San, the San Andreas Fault is always pulling focus of the faults. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that interesting that it it physically marks like a barrier between the highlands and the lowlands of Scotland? Yeah, I always assumed it would be a, was a more like you know like the Scotland England boundary. It's mm-hmm. just it's, kind of arbitrary. Yeah, it's there, but someone invented where it was slash warred over it. Well, no, this is a big fault, and there's like lots of locks and things in it. Like you can stand on like quite high ground and look out across it and you can you can see it we should definitely do that i i never knew it existed no i had no idea so this is where helen was born in 1897 that's where we're starting yep her dad was a slater the roofing kind not the bug kind (laughs) although i've also read that he was a cabinet maker Mm. so he could have been one of these who knows Uh, and her mother was an active member of their church which was a Presbyterian church. Presbyterian church. Do you remember what I said about them in the last two episodes? Oh, it's like a test. Are they the ones that are super into scripture? Yes. So their faith dictates their entire lives. Yes. And it's really important to them. They're really strict in their beliefs and morals and the way that you should live your life. And it's, it's very scripture heavy. So mm-hmm. they study the scripture in depth. Yes. So that's Helen's mum. She's super involved with the church. Oh yeah, sounds good. With me. Not the type of person who'd want to have a witch for a daughter. Well, you can see where this is going. <laughs> Drama! <laughs> so Helen really should have had a pretty quiet upbringing, mm-hmm. by all accounts. The life of a woman during the Victorian period wasn't the most interesting or the greatest. Mm. Uh, Queen Victoria died in 1901. So when Helen was born, it's right at the end of the Victorian era, era, before the Edwardian era. Yes. Which you don't need to know, but it kind of places you in history. Some good, some good context. Because I feel like when you hear the words Victorian period, mm-hmm. you kind of get a picture in your head of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think so. It places you in the scene a bit better. Mm-hmm. Pitch in there a bit more contextually. Yeah. Well, we have jumped much further in history than I anticipated for my anecdote that I was bringing to the podcast. Oh. <laughs> Kieran pre- prepared an anecdote for you. <laughs> I hope you're happy. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you and maybe edit it out because it's now no longer contextual. Aww. Uh, but it's your prepared my, story. I know. I got. I thought this the other day. I was like, oh, I could tell Ailey this. I'm going to get comfy. This is kind of like interested oh. and related. I was too hyped now. Okay. Too much pressure. I'm ready. Well, you're talking about king james and his godly powers Mm -hmm. and how he just saw himself as the god-given god divine as a god and such Mm -hmm. Uh, well in fresh meat they make the job about the job in fresh meat they make the joke about canute oh yeah and how canute cannot turn the tide yep so i was like oh who was that what even is that well that's king canute who was in the 12th century and to demonstrate to his followers that he was not godly, he sat on a chair at the edge of the water and let the tide come in and said to everyone, like, look, I cannot change the tide. Like, that's that's beyond my powers. I'm not a god. Stop treating me as one. Wow. So he was where, kind of... Where was he the king of? England. Oh. He was... Because there were two canutes. I think this is the same one. But he uh, took over the English throne as a Dutchman oh. and overthrew the English king. 
and was king for a little while, which is funny, you don't hear much about him. Well, that's funny because that happens again in the 16 or 1700s. William of Orange becomes king of England. Oh, yeah. And he was Dutch. Mm. Well, King Canute. Uh, that's him. Because ah. no one believed he wasn't a god. Because no, you're king. Like, this is a god given. Like you are, you are divine. He's Especially like, 12th century, I could see that. Yeah, and he's like, no, I'm not. Like, well, of course you are. So he did that to demonstrate that he wasn't all powerful mm. as the gods are. Well, there you go. Which is opposite to King James. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's so super related. But now there's King Edward. I'm like, oh, well. You have to hope he didn't have to sit in the water in a chair to convince people he couldn't stop the tide. Sorry, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he did. Maybe King Edward did that. Maybe. Probably not. No, <laughs> don't think so. Thus ends my anecdote. Good anecdote. Thank you. Thank you for preparing it for us. <laughs> I think I speak for everyone when I say we are thoroughly impressed and grateful. <laughs> but I'm not godly. Don't get it. Don't get overboard. Oh, I mean, you started it now. It's like a snowball. <laughs> <laughs> Go start getting like fan art and fan mail of you as a god. Mm. Don't know how I feel about this. Sounds hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we were talking about the Victorian period. Yes. And during this time, women were basically expected to work for a little bit while they were young. So mm-hmm. maybe from like early teens onwards. And this could be as a domestic servant. It could be working in a factory of some kind. Um, Generally, that was if you were lower class, Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, But then you were expected to marry. And while you were working, you were saving money to get married, Mm -hmm. to bring to your, like, what's it called? Your, like, married household. Mm. And then you were expected to just become a mother and a wife. And that was the role of the woman in Victorian society. If you didn't fit that, you were immoral and just a bad person. Naturally. Which is just really, really shitty. Yeah. I'm actually reading a lot about this in the book I'm reading just now. It's Mm -hmm. called The Five by Hallie Rubinold. And it's brilliant. It's about... It's basically giving voice back to the women who were murdered by Jack the Ripper. So it's going into their lives and their backgrounds and what life was like for them Mm -hmm. without talking about the murders all that much. It sounded super interesting. You've like read me bits and told me bits about it while you've been reading it. So interesting. I highly, highly recommend it. It's not entirely related to the story, but, you know, it's worth reading. Mm. And it's about the period that Helen was growing up in. So yeah, Helen, she had a role in a life kind of set out for her, based on what her parents expected. Mm -hmm. But Helen's childhood wasn't all that normal. In fact, her parents were pretty concerned about her. Like a lot of luckier children, although it it was becoming more common at this time, Helen was able to go to school. Mm -hmm. Uh, But while she was there, people noticed that she was a bit odd. She would make these prophecies about the future. And they'd be prophecies of doom and gloom. And she would tell these to her classmates or just around her classmates. (laughs) And they got a bit scared and a bit wound up by her making these predictions about the future. As you would. Well, yeah, I can imagine, like, primary school age. Yeah. You would freak out. I mean, you're sitting there, please, as punch, because you've drawn a cat. And the person beside you is going, the end is nigh. Yeah. The world will end on this day. I just drew a cat today. I'm chuffed. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased as punch. Can you just... Ugh, you're ruining my vibe, you yeah. know? Yeah. Her behaviour was also described as hysterical. Classic. Which, given that this is the early 1900s, that doesn't really give us any indication no. as to how she was <laughs> behaving. Like, she could have been just a little bit heightened, and because she was a girl, she would have been hysterical. Well, that's just it. It's anything that's not just... Flat. Flat. Stoic. Submissive. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but that was, that was how they described her behaviour. But the point I'm trying to make is that everyone was kind of worried by her and confused by her classmates her teachers and particularly her mother who was very religious they were worried about her and knew that this kind of behavior wasn't normal i mean you would be yeah even now you would be (laughs) i think so you'd worry i think you'd worry now that your child had just like watched something that they shouldn't have (laughs) what area of youtube are you in yeah like 
What what are you into, honey? (laughs) Can we let me check that just for a minute? (laughs) The kid in the ring drawing endless, like, black circles. Yeah. Pictures of death and stuff. I feel as a parent, that's when you should get involved. Mm. (laughs) Anyway, not much else is said about it that I could find. Um, They were worried and she grew up, basically. Fair enough. And she ended up working in the Dundee Royal Infirmary for a while. So she's moved from Calendar to Dundee. Mm-hmm. And Helen got married when she was 20, which seems kind of young now, but was fine for the time. Yeah. And she got married to a man called, called Henry Duncan. Now, he was a cabinet maker. <laughs> so that might be the confusion why some people say her dad was a cabinet maker. I mean, there's room for, room for error there. But she didn't marry her dad. No. That's not where people get confused. No. Good. <laughs> But Henry was also a World War One veteran. Oh, yeah. Uh, he'd fought in the trenches like millions of other men mm-hmm. at that time. But he was discharged because he came down with rheumatoid arthritis. Ooh. And he was diagnosed with having a weak heart. Oh, yeah. Which was something that was fairly common. It was, yeah. Um, but if you had that, it meant that you weren't suitable to be a soldier because you can't undertake like, strenuous activity. Mm-hmm. And Henry would have ill health all his life. After coming back from war, he survived, but, you know, it had a lingering impact on him. Unfortunately, Helen and Henry didn't really have an easy time adjusting to married life. Like a lot of people, they were struggling financially. They didn't have a lot of money and they had six children to support. So many children. So many children. And I saw a couple of places that said that Helen had lost between two and six children. She may have been pregnant more than six times, which is just really sad, but unfortunately really common for that time yeah. and and today i'm not saying it doesn't happen anymore but no. particularly during that period infant mortality was really high mm-hmm. so they were contending with all that six children not a lot of cash moving between them imagine having 12 pregnancies and six kids oh mm-hmm. all doesn't bear thinking about i know but it's the story for a lot of people so many loads well i mean we've done stuff looking at our family tree mm-hmm. and you see it there that People are having like, sometimes 10 children and they just, they don't survive. That's true, eh? I can't imagine how painful that must have been. No. I really can't. <laughs> There's lots of rumours swirling around at this point that Helen and Henry have an unusual connection between them. Mm-hmm. Some might say a psychic connection between them. When Henry returned from war, he talked about this vision that he had while he was fighting in the trenches of this young and beautiful girl that he fell in love with. And when he came back from war, it turned out that the girl in his vision was his younger sister's best friend, who was Helen. So weird. I wonder if, like, he did actually, like, had a vision of her because he remembered her. Or if just he was imagining just, like, misc beautiful woman. And then he saw her and was like, oh my god, like that, you're the misc beautiful woman. Maybe. Or if it's just all nonsense. (laughs) Well, maybe it was a line. Oh, yeah. I was in love with you before we met. It's a pickup line. While I was tortured by the horrors of war, (laughs) I thought of you. (laughs) I mean, it'd probably work, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But then there was another occasion where they seemed to have some kind of deep, deep connection. When they were older, Helen had the feeling... Or she had, they said it was a premonition. She had this vision, this premonition that Henry was in trouble and she had to go to him right that second. <clears throat> so she races to his workshop. He's working as a cabinet maker. And when she enters the workshop, she sees him having a heart attack. And luckily she gets there in time. She's able to get him the right help. And although he, you know, he has bad health for the rest of his life, he doesn't die that day. Well, when you've got a weak heart and then having a heart attack, that's pretty lucky, isn't it? And Helen puts that down to having a premonition that she needed to be with Henry right that second. Damn. I was really hoping he'd be stuck in one of his cabinets. Stuck in <laughs> Like the one in Harry Potter, what's it called? Is it the Vanishing Cabinet? The Vanishing Cabinet? cabinet? That one. <laughs> so he just ended up in, like, Ireland. Yeah. Or like a, like a magician gone wrong and he's locked himself in his safe and can't escape. Or half of him is in the workshop and half of him has been sent to Thurso. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mystical premonition. 
What, being split in half? Yeah, like she goes to get him and he's disappeared half into another dimension and come out again in Thurso. I mean, that'd just be a shame. (laughs) So like I said, they were struggling for money, but, you know, it seemed like Helen had this gift. This gift for spooky shit. Mm -hmm. And Henry was fully supportive. He was quite unusual for a husband of that time because... I don't think there'd be a lot of men, a lot of husbands at that time that would entertain what she said she could do. No. But he was fully supportive and he wanted he encouraged her to learn more about her gift and you know, strengthen it like a muscle. So eventually Helen would start using her skills and her powers to earn them some extra money, which they sorely needed. He'd have been like, Yeah, girl, spook it up. Monetize that shit. Hold on. That's what you said to me. <gasps> That's why we're here. <laughs> you cheeky bastard. <laughs> and history repeats itself. <laughs> Gonna vanish you in a cabinet next. So, how did Helen make money being spooky? Um, I'm assuming, like, fortune-telling, palm-reading... Speak to the dead. Come speak to your... I was going to say sad relatives. Dead relatives. Sad relatives. <laughs> so that's a counsellor. You that's... don't need a psychic to do that. <laughs> All that kind of things. Well, yes. Helen started hosting seances. Do you know what a seance is? Is it like a Beyonce with hits like Lemonade? That's offensive. <laughs> Beyonce is a treasure. So, say her name properly. So it's not pronounced seance. No. Hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you. A seance is basically a gathering of people who have all come together to, to bring their energy into one place to speak to the dead. Mm. And you know, usually, or some of the some of the time, a seance has a medium who's the one who's kind of in control, and the dead will speak through a medium who will relay messages to the rest of the group. Oh, that's useful, isn't it? Useful that even if they didn't communicate anything, they could just say things. It's kind of similar to what we talked about last episode, where before the Bible was translated into English, a minister or priest could kind of just say whatever they wanted the Bible to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And that would just be fine. (laughs) Oh, your dead relatives are saying to give me all your money. Yeah. That would make them happy. But people people would pay money at this time to go to seances and <clears throat> speak to spirits or hear from their loved ones. That was the main reason people would mm. want to go. I think they still do. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's still, still a, thing. a thing. But this was a time where spiritualism was really gaining popularity. Mm-hmm. It took off in the 1800s and then kind of had a resurgence in the 1920s, which we'll talk about in a bit. Gatsby-style seances. <laughs> but, you know, I can, I can hear you asking, Kieran, what is spiritualism? What is spiritualism? And how? what does this have to do with witches? And what does this have to do with witches, Ailey? Well, we're going to get there. But first we need to understand a bit more about spiritualism. <gasps> is this another journey through time? Kind of. Yes. Mildly. So in the late 1800s, spiritualism kind of started with the Fox sisters who lived in New York State. And they claimed that they could communicate with ghosts. So ghosts existed, they could talk to them. And more specifically, they were talking to the ghost of a man who was murdered in the house they lived in, but he was murdered before they moved into the home. (laughs) So uh, they became hugely famous. After this, there was a huge surge in spiritualism and people wanting to find mediums to talk to the dead. Mm -hmm. They believed that it was totally possible and that was something they were very interested in. And there's a couple of reasons for why it was suddenly so popular. And the first is the advance in science. So we talked about this a bit in the Burke and Hare episode, but with the advance in science that came in the 1800s came a crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. People were seeing what was possible through science with all these brand new discoveries like electricity that completely changed the entire world. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't resolve their understanding of the world with their faith Mm -hmm. the two couldn't exist at the same time so people were struggling with that and spirit spiritualism seemed to bridge the gap between a belief in life after death 
and all of the new scientific breakthroughs. Yeah, it's life after death, but without God. It seemed like a rational explanation mm-hmm. that, oh, well, of course this exists. It fits in with our scientific understanding and we can use science to explore if these things are real. It, it was that kind of vein which hadn't really existed before. Mm-hmm. So it was very different to the, all the stories of witchcraft we've talked about up until now. And I'm not saying this is witchcraft, but talking about the general attitudes towards yeah. things that we can't explain. Mm-hmm. It was changing, if that makes sense. That doesn't make sense. I'm pretty sure it was right then that Nietzsche declared that God is dead. Yeah. Well, was that later? I, can, I think he was the 1800s. 1870s. Because he declared that God is dead and there's nothing to replace him with. Which left people having this like crisis of faith thing. Well, he's a cheery guy. I know, yeah, yeah. He was, he was a bit brutal all around. It's because he was ill all the time. He's a grumpy bastard. Mm. Someone else who uh, might have had syphilis because oh. he got like dementia really young and stuff and had all these horrible illnesses. When we were talking about syphilis, uh, I can't remember. I'm sure maybe it was on the podcast. <laughs> I'm sure it was on the podcast. Oh, it was in um, episode seven, the Black Lady of Lark Hall. We discussed a character possibly having syphilis. Yes, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all of it. It's neither here nor there. He's the captain of the house. Yeah, yeah, because he went a bit barmy, didn't mm-hmm. he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, spiritualists believed, and still believe, spiritualists still exist. It's still a... Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a religion so much as just a general belief. Yeah, belief system. Yeah. I'd, I don't want to go so far as to say it's a religion. No. But... Well, People still believe in spiritualism. And it's basically the belief that spirits of the dead are able to talk to the living through mediums. Mm -hmm. And mediums are people that have this unique and incredible skill to hear the dead and communicate with them in various ways. For a small fee. (laughs) (laughs) Well, not always, not Not always. always. (laughs) But this this is the crux of what they believe, Mm -hmm. that, you know, ultimately there is life after death. And in the 1800s, mediums would hold seances hmm. where they would reach out to the other side and communicate with the dead. And they'd do things like relay messages that they'd heard from the ghosts or table turning or the medium would be able to manifest tapping on the walls or the furniture. And that was the spirits reaching out. Hmm. And now, I don't know if you know what table turning is because I couldn't have given you the definition before all my research. No, so was it... I... I have a feeling it's where the table starts like spinning on its own accord. Yes, so table turning involved everyone participating in the seance putting their hands onto the table because generally it was around a, a big table mm-hmm. and they would wait for the table to vibrate or rotate on its own and mm. that was a spirit reaching out to them. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Like, your face does not look impressed. I'm just going <laughs> to... I'm just telling you that's what it is. <laughs> I hold no judgments here. I should, uh, should probably say now Kieran's a sceptic. I'm quite sceptic. Uh, which is fine. But it is going to colour his general attitude to this whole episode. I'm yeah. just going to say it right now. That's just the way it is. <laughs> you can assume I'm listening to most of this with like a furrowed brow and like a curled lip. I'm just like, Ugh. Well, which is nice because it's not at me. No. <laughs> it's just... You just have a very certain belief system. It is not speaking to the dead through a medium belief system. (laughs) So the rise in spiritualism also led to a rise in groups of experts trying to discover whether or not psychic abilities were real. So the more people were coming forward saying they could do all these things, Mm -hmm. the bigger drive there was to really find out if it was the truth. You know, they wanted to know if people really could read other people's thoughts Mm -hmm. or if psychics really could predict the future or get glimpses of the future and they wanted to know if ghosts were real yeah so that was a whole like field of science Mm -hmm. at that time i know that it's not considered a science now well it's because it's it kind of got disproved scientifically yeah they just it just finished but at that time this was an area of exploration they wanted to know and these questions still fascinate a lot of us today. You know, it, there are still people divided on these topics. Mm-hmm. It's not like 
it's not the same as the witch hunts that we talked about that are completely in the past. Yes. And people don't think that way anymore, mm-hmm. generally. Don't think that way anymore. This is still kind of lingering in its own way. It's just changed. Mm. In my opinion, anyway. I think it's because it still plays into our fears and our wonderings about life after death. Like Everyone wants to know what happens. And that's something that's part of the human condition, I think. That doesn't go away. Absolutely. So it's still... It's still a question. Especially when there's people like in pain if they've lost loved ones and things. Exactly. That's universal mm-hmm. across time. Like losing a loved one is always painful. Yeah. So yeah, I understand why they were so interested in this topic. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Ooh. was one of the people fully taken in by spiritualism. Was he? Mm-hmm. 100%. He was fully... On the spiritualist train. The writer of Sherlock Holmes? The writer of Sherlock Holmes. And The Lost World, which inspired Jurassic Park. Oh, well there you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of crazy Mm -hmm. authors. Jurassic Park. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I learned that Aldous Huxley. Oh yeah. uh, The author of Brave New World. Yep. Was part of scientific experiences testing out psychedelics. That makes a lot of sense. Doesn't it? (laughs) Because... I'm reading about Satra, Jean-Paul Satra, uh, and he got injected with some, like, siphoned... It wasn't psilocybin, which is the ones of magic mushrooms, but it was something like that. And, like, these mostly philosophers and academics would take them and sit in a room and then, like, journal and, like, write about their experiences mm. as of the first, like, hmm, what is this? And everyone was all like, oh, wow, like, shimmering rainbows, all this wonder. And his was, like, horrible, drowning, alien fish, dinosaurs... That then haunted him for the next several months at the corner of his vision. Ew. And Aldous Huxley was another person who, yeah, because that then fed into his writing. And so did Aldous Huxley. He also took part in these studies, mm. which I thought was very telling and hilarious. See, now that we're talking about mushrooms and we're recording a podcast, mm. are we now Joe Rogan? Because <gasps> I fucking hope not. <laughs> <laughs> And we're not talking about like how great mushrooms are and how everyone should get high all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, mm-hmm. he was fully on board. He believed it completely, partly because he genuinely 100% believed that he had made contact with his dead son. Oh, wow. And he was convinced. I see, again, that's something that's so painful. How could you argue with someone who looked you in the face and said that they had found peace because they spoke to their son yeah you couldn't unless you were heartless that you that i couldn't do that no even like i don't even really know what i believe in i couldn't argue with someone like that no yeah my skepticism and judgment is always off of people who are claiming to be the mediums who are financially gaining because I fully understand why people like go to them. Like that makes complete sense. I would never. Well, it's. A, I would never dissuade someone. Well, from no, doing that. It, it does. It makes complete sense. You, there's no questioning why someone would go down that path. No, and if you've lost your son, I'm like yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, that was him. That he was completely convinced. And Sir William Crookes, who you probably don't know, I do not. He was the president of the Royal Society, which. If you're looking blank, but it is a big deal. Because the Royal Society was basically in charge of all scientific investigation across the UK. Mm. Were they notably corrupt? Were they a bunch of crooks? Yeah, I'm in the middle of my story. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave you like a like a big fact and you just <laughs> Anyway, mm. the Royal Society was a big deal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was the president of, of the Royal Society and he investigated spiritualism and claims made by spiritualists personally. Damn. And he even decided that a woman named Florence Cook was a genuine medium. Oh, wow. And he was huge in the scientific world. That's unreal. And even he was saying that she was genuine. Yeah. Isn't that wild? That is wild. Who, who was it he said was genuine? Florence Cook, okay. who I haven't looked into in great detail because this is already quite a long episode. There's a lot of information here, but I just thought that was insane. That is insane. That's a thing that actually happened. Yeah. Wow. Because the, 
like the basic scientific investigation that disproves it is you get 10 mediums to all read one person's mind and if they don't all have the same answer then it's nothing or they take them into the, a room where there's a murder and they're like oh yeah I can like, communicate with spirits if they don't all separately if they don't all come up with the same thing then it proves it's not scientific but then I guess it's tricky because then you could claim that there are no spirits there so that's why they didn't get anything True, but if it was somewhere that like, oh yeah, like I always like speak to spirits here, this is like a really like haunted place, and then they all go there and they all give different answers. Yeah, I guess, but what I'm saying is that's why it could never be proven one way or the other. Oh yeah, it's not. It's not. Because it's so subjective. Absolutely definitive. But in a basic nutshell, that's how you can mm-hmm. test it. Well, this is a good time to talk about Mr. Harry Houdini. Oh! You'll like Harry Houdini. I do like Harry First Houdini. First off, he was a magician. <laughs> That's just cool. Duh. But he actually dedicated a huge portion of his life and his time to debunking and exposing fraudulent mediums and spiritualists. I did not know that. Which is what you said you don't agree with. Yep. He he spent his time exposing them. Mm. And he wrote like a lot of books and a lot of articles and things about it. And I can't remember, I saw it somewhere how many he had exposed throughout his career. But yeah, that, that's what he did. Jeez, oh. And in his book called A Magician Among the Spirits, <laughs> which is all about this topic, he wrote, After 25 years of ardent research and endeavour, I declare that nothing has been revealed to convince me that intercommunications have been established between the spirits of the departed and those still in the flesh. Wow. I definitely want to read that book. And I'm pretty sure he and Conan Doyle were friends <laughs> and just had wildly different beliefs. Like, they couldn't agree on this one thing they just had to not talk about it i'm fairly sure fair but one thing i thought was interesting looking at spiritualism as a whole was that even though victorian society was weighted heavily (laughs) in favor of men women were viewed as being better mediums that's interesting because they were seen as being more spiritual Mm. so this meant that a lot of the people who were really passionate about spiritualism and taken in by it, Mm -hmm. were huge supporters of women's rights and the woman's right to vote. Oh, that's nice. So that was kind of a a byproduct of spiritualism and that general, you know, misconception. Or maybe not, I don't know. But yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So back to seances, now that we've talked about spiritualism. Yep. You with me? Um. They were kind of a mixture of genuine belief in spirits and faith and a form of entertainment. Mm. Especially as we're getting towards sort of the end of the 1900s. The craze had kind of died, as these things do. Everything has its peak and then trails off. Mm-hmm. Until World War I. Mm. So we're in the early 1900s now. I was so surprised. Like, oh my, I forgot World War One was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you look so confused. I was just so affronted. Like, oh, but we're thinking about like whether I'm, I'm still thinking about Houdini and being like, ha, hey, you're a phony. And then we're in World Houdini War One. wasn't the phony. Uh, Houdini saying to people. Oh, right. I was like, no, Houdini was always on the level. <laughs> but they're phonies. So okay. no, we're jumping from the late 1800s to 1914 to 1918, also known as World War One. Oh man, things going to get brutal very fast. <laughs> yes. So you have... This atrocious world war mm-hmm. where I think it was something stupid like 20 million soldiers were killed. Horrific. Mm-hmm. On top of this, you have the flu pandemic. Oh, yeah. I've right. never, because that's 1918, isn't it? The Spanish flu. Yes, I think so. I've never put two and two together. So think about how awful pandemics are. Oh man, I can't imagine being in like a flu pandemic. I know, wouldn't that be the actual Oof. worst? Oof. You'd be so bored, you'd be pushed to start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I saw some figures that globally, the flu pandemic killed 50 million people. Fuck. So you're in... You're in a situation where everybody has lost someone special to them. Mm -hmm. Everybody. There's nobody, 
or very, very few people who were untouched either by the war or the pandemic. So this meant a lot of people were struggling with grief and loss. They lost families, loved ones, partners, children, and more people than ever were needing reassurance that things were okay Mm -hmm. and their loved ones were at peace and weren't in pain and that they were safe and they were fine. Like, just let that sink in for a minute. All those millions of people. Yeah, that's chilling. So you can... It is quite chilling. You can feel yourself settling into that horrible atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Or I can, if you think about it too long. It's just awful. Can we go back to uh, Duncan being stuck in his cabinet? It's much more pleasant. Well, no, because Helen Duncan has entered the chat. <laughs> okay, so remember I said that Henry, not Duncan. Wait, where am I? Right, so, Helen has entered the chat. Mm -hmm. It is now 1926. Okay. So, the the First World War is finished, Mm -hmm. has been for several years, but people are still unpacking and dealing with their loss, and with how society's changed, Mm -hmm. because everything changed. You know, there wasn't anyone to do certain jobs anymore, things like that. People were just gone. The horse population was almost annihilated exactly. in World War One. You know, everything is changing. And in 1926, Helen started offering seances. Hmm. So up until then, she'd been doing kind of just lowly psychic stuff, you know, keeping it chill. <laughs> and this was, when, <laughs> this was when she was also working part-time in a bleach factory. So she was having to work pretty hard for her money. Well, I imagine that's equally horrible. A bleach factory in the 20s. Yeah. That's not going to be a good gig. Yeah. So now she was speaking to the dead instead. Is that better? Might be better. Maybe I'll level up. Now, I'm. it's quite It's quite appropriate that we have the curtain shut and it's quite dark in here. Mm-hmm. Because I'm about to paint you a picture of what Helen's seances were like. Okay. And it is about to get weird. Okay, well you can't flip this table. I have quite a lot of my shit on it. <laughs> I'm not going to flip any tables. Okay. But I'm just warning you, it's going to get strange. <laughs> and I know the face you're going to pull. And I'm just, I'm hoping you're ready for it. You can describe it to the listeners as it happens. I mean, I can try. <laughs> I can try. I'm only human. Just like, picture a face, but someone's punched it. <laughs> <laughs> picture a face, but someone's used that swirly effect that you get. <laughs> anyway. You're being taken to a house that you've never been to before by a friend who insisted that she didn't want to go alone. She tells you that you're going to see a real live medium. Helen Duncan. The Helen Duncan. She's famous. She's travelled all over the country holding seances and reaching out to the dead. So you enter the house, you enter a dark room, and there's a large pair of dark curtains at the end of this room, and lots of chairs sitting in a kind of semicircle in front of it. So you and your friend take a seat. You wait as everybody fills in around you, waiting for the seance to start. Now a hush falls over the little crowd as Helen Duncan emerges from the shadows and she's dressed completely in black. And she's very solemn. She's very focused. Her husband, Henry, helps her to take a seat in this wooden cabinet that he's made for her. It's very, very quiet. And you can hear that everybody's holding their breath, just waiting for something to happen. Now, Helen is sitting completely alone, just surrounded by these curtains. She's behind these curtains, open slightly so you can see her. And then she falls into some kind of trance. Her eyes close. She doesn't seem aware of anything that's happening around her anymore. She doesn't seem able to see or hear anyone else in the room. And that's when it starts to happen. A strange white material starts spilling out of her mouth. It's not quite liquid. It's not quite solid. You can only just see it in the low light of the room. It keeps going and going until it becomes clear that this is a spirit. A spirit is manifesting in the room in front of you. Eventually, the spirit is strong enough to move independently and you think you can see a face. 
the face of a spirit. And you can feel your heart thumping, but it can't be real. Can it? No. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't get you at all with my storytelling voice. It was phenomenally told. Not even a little bit. A little bit. No, even just a couple of goosebumps. If you got goosebumps, if you're listening to this, you'll tell me, right? I mean, maybe a few courtesy goosebumps. I don't mean you, I mean the people. The people, if they get goosebumps, know, they'll I tell know. me. They will. They'll let you know on Instagram. I'm so, <laughs> that was a shameless plug. But I appreciate you for it. So what do you think? I mean, that is very weird. You are not wrong. Because uh, I, I think it's the strangest thing I've ever read. Yeah, who whose account was this? How, where did you... Well, this is... There are pictures. This is what her seances were like. There are pictures of this? Yes. And oh, my we'll, God. We'll get into them. We'll get into oh them. Oh, my God. But there are pictures. And there's a reason there are pictures, which is why I'm not getting into it yet. Some, somebody took them. They will be on the Instagram account. At Genuinely Spooky. At Genuinely Spooky on Instagram, which is all shiny and new now that I've revamped it. Yeah. Um, so th- these are accounts from people that were there or I've kind of I've put together a couple yeah. of it's just to make that sort of a story but she would travel around the country mm-hmm. as her fame grew over that couple of years and that's what seances were like there was a big set of curtains at one end that she would sit behind in this sort of open wooden box or ca- it's not a box it's like a cabinet mm-hmm. it's like an open cabinet that Henry made for her and in the photos, she's wearing a very specific black garment. But I think generally she was wearing black. And that is what would happen. That's bizarre. I just, I mean, my brain's going, well, obviously it's fake, obviously. But just but think, about, think about that image of someone who was there. Well, that would blow your brain, wouldn't like, it? If you put you aside for a moment and Mm. think about the people who were there witnessing it at the time in that atmosphere yeah ugh yeah (laughs) but yeah honest to god that's (laughs) to be saying this nope (laughs) well yeah honest to god that's what Helen was famous for Helen claimed she could communicate with spirits and allow them to manifest in the room by emitting something called ectoplasm from her mouth Oh, ectoplasm. On aforementioned Wikipedia page, I saw when you were doing your research, there was one heading that was ectoplasm and then one heading that was World War. Possibly two, one or two. And that's why I didn't say anything about it, because I want to ruin the story. Oh, I saw my ectoplasm. What the hell is going on here? I told you it was going to get weird. You did. I warned you. (laughs) No, that is so bizarre. Because I'm sitting here being like, oh, I wonder if it's like if she does cold reading. Like, that's what it is. Where they, like, uh, mediums kind of coax you into giving them the answers that they say back to you. And it seems like they're doing it. I'm like, oh, I wonder if it'll be like, if that happens. Not someone's vomiting ectoplasm that then forms a face. Or not that someone's swallowed this whole reel of silk that she then voms back up for the show. (laughs) Well, this... We'll focus on the ectoplasm just for a minute. Because this weirded me out so much when I read about it to begin with. But this was actually a more common belief among spiritualists at that time than you might think. This was like a generally accepted method of communicating with spirits. So Helen wasn't the only one doing this or who believed in this. This was a thing. I mean, this is the first time I've ever heard of this. So uh, just... Me and you, yes, but then... Yeah, I'm surprised it was I mean, as normal as it could have been yeah and th- this is what she was famous for people went to her seances and came away having seen a real spirit manifest in front of them i mean i'd go and see that because of helen for the wrong reasons but i would definitely go to that even though i guess as i called it a show it's not a show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's i suppose for a lot of people it would have just danced that line between something serious and something entertaining hmm you know yeah absolutely Anyway, there was a man called Vincent Woodcock who, (laughs) (laughs) he was so enthralled by Helen's powers that he attended her seances 19 times. Damn. 19 times. It's like the people who saw Star Wars over and over again. Yeah, 
But each time he'd gone, he came away convinced that he had made contact with his dead wife. He was convinced that his wife had spoken to him, he had seen her, spoken with her. He was utterly convinced. And on one time in particular, he explained that he'd gone to a seance with his Mm sister-in-law, so his dead wife's sister. And Helen made contact with his departed wife, which obviously just seemed kind of routine at that point. And Helen caused her to materialise in the room. And then the spirit spoke. And Vincent's wife apparently told him that for the sake of their daughter, he should marry her sister. The spirit even took off her wedding ring and put it on the finger of her sister. Hooft. That's crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. And then he married her. A year later, he went to another one of Helen's seances and received the blessing of his dead wife for marrying her sister after she told him to. I'm trying not to just fight it on everyone because otherwise (laughs) the story will be really stilted of me being like, nope! (laughs) Obviously he's lying. (laughs) That's crazy though. In essence. But see, I don't think he thinks he's lying. Judging from what we'll talk about later, I think he genuinely believes in what he saw. Damn. But that doesn't mean what he saw was genuine. No. But I think he genuinely believes it. Crazy. Just crazy. So as Helen's fame grew, more and more stories emerged about what she was able to do. Spirits were able to materialise whenever she had a seance. They could speak to their loved ones, they could touch them, they could communicate properly, mm-hmm. which was just astounding. There's definitely some Chinese whispers going on with these these stories, I reckon. Well, Helen started getting a bit of heat in 1928, two years after she started holding seances. Mm-hmm. Harvey Metcalf was a man who was a photographer, and he became interested in Helen's story after he heard about her skills and what she was able to do. You would have. So he came along to one of her seances with his camera. A camera that was equipped with a flash. Oh. Do you see where I'm going? Oh. Now remember I said there were photos? Yeah. This is where the photos come in. Interesting. He took some photos in the seance and shockingly, they showed that the spirits weren't genuine. (gasps) Can can you believe that? I almost dropped my monocle. (laughs) Straight into my brandy. (laughs) So the flash goes off in the dark Mm. and what usually can't be seen is seen. And the photo showed masks and faces made from paper mache and ghosts that were literally made out of bed sheets. (laughs) Did you see this coming? I mean, I can't say I was invested in her show. Not the specifics. I didn't realise it was as far as someone just standing there in a costume going... Ugh. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that's what he found. But this doesn't explain the ectoplasm. You know, the ectoplasm that Helen was producing from her mouth mm-hmm. that was, like, weird, wet, sticky, ick. Do you think it was a baking soda and vinegar thing and just no one had ever seen it before? Well, I'm about to tell you. Ooh, can I throw some guesses? You can, before we get into it. Guess me. Uh, baking soda and vinegar. Okay, that would be foam. Just being clear. I suppose it would look a bit different. depending. Okay, Fair continue. Enough. Um, she just has, like, silk in her mouth that someone, like, pulls strings or unravels. Okay. Or, um, beforehand, she just, like, effectively downs lots of a milk-like substance. Uh, a milk-like drink, mm-hmm. which she then throws up throws up again, but slightly more controlled and gentle in the way people put keys in their throat kind of thing. Okay. I noticed you haven't suggested real ectoplasm. Is that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Uh, y- yes, I don't, I don't believe it was, was the ectoplasm. Okay. Well, in 1931, so mm-hmm. we're jumping a few, a few years ahead, so Harvey took his photos... In this time, Helen was still doing seances, even though these photos existed. There were still people who believed in her. I can recall viral, could it? (laughs) But in 1931, an organisation called the London Spiritualist Alliance got involved after hearing all kinds of stories about Helen. Mm. They basically wanted to investigate whether or not she was genuine. 
since there were rumours going around that she was a fraud. And the spiritualist movement was plagued with frauds. It was a real problem for people who genuinely believed in ghosts and life mm-hmm. after death. They wanted to get rid of frauds as much as anybody did. That's true, that's true. So that's what the LSA were trying to do. Mm-hmm. So I just want to say that, that there are people in this movement who, you know, they don't like frauds either. Well, it's like um, in the Black Lady episode, the guy who'd claimed to have seen her, whose name I've forgotten. Tom Robertson? Yes. The ghost hunter? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. he was saying how... This is a good plug for episode seven. I know. <laughs> a lot of similar things. Because he, he was a ghost hunter and he would see ghosts and be affected by ghosts. But I fully believe there's lots of people who are phonies. Yeah, yeah, similar thing. But they they dislike them as much as anybody mm-hmm. else. So the LSA visited Helen 50 times between 1930 and 1931. Damn. They were extremely thorough. That they did thorough. a proper investigation into her methods, what she claimed to be able to do, everything. It's like a Monty Python sketch that's writing itself. <laughs> kind of, yeah. But they were trying to decide whether or not she was genuine, and it was extremely important to them that they got it right. So they had her wear specific seance garments, which was basically like a like a loose sat- satiny black suit that covered her hands and like her feet. Like nothing could be stashed in a pocket or anything. Mm. And it was shiny, so there was no hidden pockets or anything. Oh, yeah. So they did that so nothing could be hidden underneath, nothing could be stashed anywhere. But then the more that they sat with Helen, Mm -hmm. sat in on her seances, they realised that they often heard these weird, distressed, choking noises coming from the cabinet (laughs) when no one could see her. It's, you know, suspicious. (laughs) 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 Okay, like, one sec, guys. (laughs) You okay? Yeah, fine. (laughs) Okay, I'm ready. Open up. Oh, I don't want them. <laughs> so they came up with a way to try and try and just solve this little problem. And what they did was they got her to take a methylene blue tablet. Now I couldn't find exactly what this tablet is, mm-hmm. but basically it empties the tubes. Oh. Um so they got her to take this tablet. She had ectoplasm coming out of both ends. <laughs> <laughs> Before the seance. And shockingly, after she had taken this tablet, during that seance, she wasn't able to produce any ectoplasm. Oh. Shocking. Mm. So the LSA are going, hang on, something's not right here. They decided they needed to get up close and personal with this ectoplasm, which I'm sure they weren't thrilled about. <laughs> but they needed to know what was up with it. They needed to know. The, like, at least five visits were definitely spent doing like rock, paper, scissors to decide who had to go and get some. <laughs> <laughs> so they managed to get a sample of the ectoplasm from uh, Helen mm. during a seance, I think. And they sent it to a psychical researcher called Harry Price. So he was one of those experts that I told you about that are trying to figure out if spiritualists are real in a scientific manner. Yep. He's one of them. And they sent the sample to him to try and find out what it was made of and if it was genuine. So he studied it in a lab. He had mm-hmm. a, a laboratory. He was a proper scientist. It sounds a bit mean to other people, proper scientists, <laughs> but you know what I mean? He was genuine. <clears throat> and he basically discovered that this ectoplasm was a combination of several different materials. So uh, some samples were cheesecloth, some were paper egg whites, toilet paper, and there was sort of a blend of chemicals that I couldn't find the breakdown for. Mm. But Price was even able to replicate the ectoplasm himself. No seance required. But they still didn't know how she was doing it. Well, I was about to think, like, it's... I I sort of... I got some of the things there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the mixture. But... Going from A to B, like mm-hmm. scoffing that before a show to then vomit it up night after night. Oh. Yeah, they couldn't decide exactly how this was working, but they had done the breakdown on the material and knew that it, it wasn't spiritual in any way. The pieces were coming together, but they didn't have the full story. What if she was just like, no, that's ectoplasm. What's well, all these things? Well, do you have any ectoplasm to compare it to? Well, but, just no. you wait, sir. 
story is not over yet. So remember when I said the LSA gave Helen the methylene blue tablet? Yes. And then nothing happened, no ectoplasm? Yes. Right, well, Price believed that Helen was swallowing the ectoplasm made of all the paper and everything, Mm -hmm. and then was regurgitating it during seances. So she wasn't vomiting, she was just bringing it up kind of like a bird. Yeah. <laughs> a so, bit more control than just yes. projectiling so, over. So you were right. She's not yeah. she's not being sick, but she's able to bring it up. Very impressive. And one of the samples that got sent away aside from this turned out to be a long piece of white silk. <laughs> so you were correct. <laughs> but just think about that for a minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. But she was regurgitating it during the seances to make it seem as if she was producing it herself. Mm -hmm. So this all makes sense with the tablet experiment, why she wasn't able to bring anything up if her stomach and everything was completely empty. Mm -hmm. Helen also suffered nosebleeds sometimes during seances, which could have been down to times when ectoplasm would mysteriously appear from her nose as well as her mouth. I mean... You know, it's it's all connected back there. It's not going to be great for your general throat esophagus Mm -hmm. and everything that's back there well even just i don't know i don't know how different regurgitation is from vomiting but you know if you're sick there's a lot of acid that affects like your teeth and your throat and everything and even like bits of paper going up and down the inside of your throat well they would be soft at that point she soaked paper in egg white even still like that's still not great i'm just saying it wouldn't be sharp no it wouldn't just be like paper cuts up and down (laughs) so price had this theory regurgitation but he he still had to prove it it's all very well for him to say that but he can't prove that she's doing that Mm. so price actually paid helen to perform seances for him oh yeah and he would watch her really carefully to try and spot deception and try and see if Mm -hmm. he could tell what was going on and he paid her 50 pound for this which i think is about 800 pound in today's money not bad not bad so he he went full in he was getting to the bottom of this the way a scientist should. Mm -hmm. So it seems like Helen's goose is cooked. Yep. Right? What you said, that, you know, it's been completely discovered. But Helen stands by her story. She is adamant that she is not a fraud and that everything is genuine. And I would believe that she fully believed that. Steadfast, 100%. The ectoplasm is real. She's not making it herself. It's not made of paper and egg white. She's not regurgitating it. The spirits are real. Damn. Right? Mm. I was thinking that that kind of thing is very much what like a modern day magician would do. Right. Like, you know, that's, that's got David Blaine written all over it. Him sitting in this cabinet regurgitating ectoplasm. I mean, like, what the fuck is going on? And that's just, he's learned how to control... Like, regurgitating it. But see, my problem is that she is completely adamant that this is ectoplasm, even though she is making it. Well, that's just it. Like, presumably her husband's not funneling it down her throat when she's not looking. It has been proven that this is... This is, you know... I'm trying to think of the word. Like, naturally occurring. There's nothing unusual in this. It's all made of things that you have. Things her husband were like, oh, here, hun, we're having scrambled eggs again before the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, immediately before, the way that you like. <laughs> the way that you always have to channel your powers. I know you're allergic, but this is what we're doing. <laughs> so Harry Price continues with his investigation to prove that this is going on and she's a fraud. Well, if she's not backing down and he can't prove it, like properly prove it, what, what's he going to do? He's, he's got to... He's fully invested. Yeah. So he suggests that Helen take an x-ray, since that would definitively prove things one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not sure that that would have worked, because I don't know if that would show up on an x-ray. No, unless there was, like, metal in it. Well, or... unless the chemicals that he talked about would show up in an x-ray. I don't know. Mm, yeah. But that was what he suggested. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if he suggested that to kind of scare Helen. Oh, yeah. He's like, well, you know, we'll do an x-ray and that'll see absolutely everything. An x-ray. Even, even if he knew that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, an x-ray in the 30s. That's got to be a bit dodgy. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I know that by our standards that probably wouldn't work, but that was his suggestion. Mm-hmm. Now, Price suggests the x-ray to Helen, like I said, and then this is what happened. And this is what Price wrote in his report at the end <laughs> of all this. Okay, 
At the conclusion of the fourth seance, we led the medium, Helen, to a settee and called for the apparatus. At the sight of it, the lady promptly went into a trance. She recovered, but refused to be x-rayed. Her husband went up to her and told her it was painless. She jumped up and gave him a smashing blow on the face, which sent him reeling. Then she went for Dr. William Brown, who was present. Can't have a man with a weak heart. He dodged the blow. (laughs) Mrs. Duncan, without the slightest warning, dashed out into the street, had an attack of hysteria and began to tear her seance garment to pieces. She clutched the railings and screamed and screamed. Her husband tried to pacify her. It was useless. Mm. I leave the reader to visualise the scene. A 17 stone woman, clad in black sateen tights, locked to the railings, screaming at the top of her voice. A crowd collected and the police arrived. The medical men with us explained the position and prevented them from fetching the ambulance. We got her back into the laboratory and at once she demanded to be x-rayed. In reply... (laughs) I know... In reply, Dr. William Brown turned to Mr. Duncan and asked him to turn out his pockets. He refused and would not allow us to search him. There is no question that his wife had passed the cheesecloth in the street. (laughs) Or passed him the cheesecloth. Yeah. However, they gave us another seance and the control said we could cut off a piece of teleplasm when it appeared. The sight of half a dozen men each with a pair of scissors waiting for the word, was amusing. It came and we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured a piece. The medium screamed and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in white of egg, folded into a flattened tube. Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money and energy (laughs) on the antics of a fat female crook? Wow. What an episode. Wow. Is that the end? Yep, that's what he wrote in his official report. I mean, is that the end of your story? No, 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 no. (laughs) I mean, it's when you said, what an episode. Are we finishing No, I just mean her episode that she had in response to this x-ray. Now that, that is hysterics. I will accept that. I think full on screaming and... Tearing at your own Wailing, yeah. I could put that within that realm. Yeah, I think that counts. I still resent a man saying it about a woman in any well, it's it's been any circumstance too but, misused. But I see what you're saying. Yeah. So yeah, that was what he wrote. That the paints quite the picture. Yeah, he was quite cruel, and he was quite cruel. basically outed her as a fraud. Yeah, quite cruel. Also, just super pissed off. Like I have much better things to be doing than this, but I've started. And I have to finish. <laughs> so, in this report that he he put together on Helen, he. He really went in on her. He laid everything out. He explained that she used the fake ectoplasm and she used portraits cut out of magazines hmm. and rubber gloves to manifest the spirits in her seances that they weren't real. So it, he he went in hard. Yeah, and It wasn't good for Helen's reputation. When, well, you would think not. When the report was actually published, her maid and her husband confirmed what Price had thought. They admitted to helping her with all this stuff and that the ectoplasm was regurgitated. They admitted that it wasn't true. I mean, I respect that. Yeah, fair. You got us. Right? You were right. But do you think that stopped Helen? Definitely not. Absolutely not. (laughs) No. She continued to travel, continued to hold seances, and there were still people that believed she was the real deal. 100%. Yeah. She divided the public hugely but this wouldn't be the end of helen's woes with fraud if anything it was all about to get worse so in a seance in 1933 in edinburgh one of the women who was present felt a spirit touching her legs around her skirt under the table Mm. and she (laughs) she didn't get scared in the way that helen might have expected in response to this the woman lunged at whatever was under the table, grabbed it and saw that it was just a knitted vest. (laughs) And she was furious that she had been duped into thinking that this was a spirit, this was a ghost. So she called the police Hmm. and they they came along and they they charged Helen. She was prosecuted with fraud, I think. 
uh, and fined ten pounds. Oh, oh, well, that's just you know, that's a twentieth, a twentieth, a fifth of her earnings of Doctor Price, Mister mm-hmm. Price. Yep, she was charged. But her downfall really began in 1941. It's not began yet. And this is why she's included in our series about witchcraft. What's oh. about to happen. Okay, okay. So I hope, you're, I hope you're ready. I am ready. This is the reason that she's included in our series about witchcraft. I've been so wrapped up in her story, I forgot this was part of a yeah. witchcraft episode. Yeah, if you're listening, you probably thought I'd forgotten that... I was just going to ramble about Helen Duncan. No, there's I mean, a reason that she's in this series. You could have rambled about her. That could have been the end when you said the end of that episode. Mm-hmm. And we could have finished. And then you didn't like, oh, the end of the miniseries. I'd be like, holy shit, we're doing a miniseries. I forgot. <laughs> well, she's very relevant to our stories about witchcraft. Just not in the way you might expect. Mm. It feels weird not being able to see it. I don't know why. So in November 1941, yes, Helen was in Portsmouth, so she's down south, mm-hmm. and she was holding seances in a place called the Master's Temple of Spiritual Healing, which was over a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, at this time, the country and the world are in the thick of World War II. Mm-hmm. It didn't end until 1945. So... I want to say particularly down south, but that's not very fair. There there were bombings in Scotland, but, you know, everyone's afraid of the bombs or losing family members who are away fighting. Mm-hmm. There's a general atmosphere of fear that you couldn't get away from, especially in World War II. This was the first time that warfare had really been brought home in the UK. True. There yeah. hadn't been that kind of warfare on UK soil before, mm. where bombs are being dropped every night, things like that. Oh, so, you know, it, it's a frightening time. So we're in Portsmouth, mm. and Helen held a seance. <laughs> Why? Are you, you don't even know what I'm going to say yet. Oh, it's just like, there's the ravages of World War II, and they're like, I'm going to do a seance and barf up all this paper for people. <laughs> I'm doing my bit for king and country. Well, <laughs> it's interesting that you should say she was doing her bit for king and country, because the crowd were faced with a shocking manifestation. Oh, no. The spirit of a soldier appeared to them. And even more shocking, the soldier revealed to Helen that a warship called the HMS Barham, B-A-R-H-A-M, had been sunk. Now, there was no announcements about this. No, because, you know, announcements would come through the papers Mm -hmm. and sometimes at the beginning of films at the cinema. Oh, yeah. um, You'd have the newsreel of what had happened in the war. There have been no announcements about this ship, mm. nothing about it being sunk. So this revelation placed Helen directly under the radar of the Navy because no one except the families of the casualties of the sinking were supposed to know it had sunk. Oh, shit. Helen was right. It had sunk and she was not supposed to know about it <laughs> because she wasn't related to anyone in the tragedy. No. The public weren't told about this until January 1942. So two months later. Two months later. Which is something that the powers that be did fairly regularly during the war to Mm. keep up morale and kind of manage how these things came out. Yeah. So the Navy were not impressed and they had no idea how she knew this information. (laughs) The fuck is this? Right? A researcher called Graham Donald, he's done all the sums and figured out so how many people probably found out about the HMS Baron mm-hmm. before the public? Because he's much smarter than I am. And you know, there's a good chance that she overheard it. He sort of worked out how many lives were lost. So how many family members found out. And what the chances were of these family members telling one other person. Well, yeah, I was, I was thinking she must have overheard it somewhere. Yeah, so chances are she just overheard it. Or... News just spread the way that most things do when no one is supposed to know. Naturally. Very, very quickly, you know? Mm -hmm. So on the 14th of January, 1944, so three years later, Mm -hmm. two lieutenants attended one of Helen's seances in Portsmouth. And one of them was called Lieutenant Worth. And he was utterly appalled by what he saw. He was... 
I, I think the Wikipedia page said he was disgusted mm-hmm. by what he watched. And it just sounded like it was a disaster from beginning to end for Helen because she was trying to communicate with the lieutenant's dead relatives who he didn't have and was trying to say that the things like his dead aunt was coming through and relaying a message mm-hmm. and none of his aunts had died. <laughs> and then a white clothed figure appeared behind the curtain who was supposedly his dead sister and his sister was fine. So he was just watching all of this and he was just... Oh, farce. Yeah. He probably reacted very similarly to how you would react, to be honest. Just not there for it at all. And the, the two lieutenants were so offended by what they had seen Helen do, they reported her to the police. Again. <laughs> yeah, again, again. <laughs> They just they couldn't believe that she was actually managing to dupe people with this act, and mm-hmm. they didn't think it was honest or fair. But even though Helen had been dividing the public for a long time, this was when the police decided to intervene. Yeah, well, especially during war. They may not have other times, but... Well, we're going to get into that a little bit later. Okay. Stick a pin in that thought that even though Helen had been doing this for a long time, mm-hmm. like 20 years, this was when the police decided to do something. So five days after the lieutenant's shockingly terrible seance, undercover police went to Helen's seance. And they sat in the audience, completely inconspicuous, didn't make a big deal out of themselves. Mm. They were just there to join in the show. And they were watching her carry out the seance, and from what they could see, everything was a complete joke. Completely fraudulent. But they decided that enough was enough when a big white-clothed figure appeared from behind the curtain and started addressing the crowd. Mm -hmm. That was when they decided, no, you're definitely taking the piss. (laughs) We're stopping this right now. You are having a giraffe, mate. Yeah. So the police stepped forward and revealed to everyone that Helen was standing under the cloth. And obviously, there's no spirit there. It was her all along. And she even tried to hide the cloth when the police outed her. But it it was too late. (laughs) She tried to pretend it wasn't there. So Helen was originally arrested under vagrancy laws of the time. I think they were from 1842. So (laughs) I say of the time, but they were what were in place Mm -hmm. in 1944. And these covered things like fortune telling. Mm. So if you were doing these things, you could be arrested under the vagrancy laws. However, and I say however... Because this is important. Mm. Helen's charge was changed before she was brought to the Old Bailey in London for trial. So she wasn't just tried in Portsmouth. This was taken to the Old Bailey, which was a big deal. Damn. She would be charged under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. Oh, shit. Are you surprised? I, I did not think that would come around again. You didn't see it coming? No, not until the very end. We're talking about what would you charge her with? Oh, we're talking about he's here to bit witchcraft. Well, to clar- we have a few things to clarify mm. because a lot of things have gotten muddied as time's gone on, mainly because of the name of this law. So you remember in the past couple of episodes, we talked a lot about the different witchcraft acts. So when Agnes Sampson, this is why you should listen to these episodes in order, by the way. The people just, will. Just saying. Um, when Agnes Sampson was tried being charged of being a witch was a full-on death sentence especially in scotland yes even associating with a witch was a death sentence yes right but then when isabel gowdy was charged they were no longer allowed to torture confessions yeah and it wasn't just like you could con- not conspire with you could associate with a witch and be f- or not be put to death at least i don't know about that i just know that they couldn't torture for confessions I'm anymore sure. Sure, you couldn't you mm-hmm. maybe maybe i did but, you know, the yeah, law was yeah. changing and they had to send all of their evidence to the Privy Council mm-hmm. and get approval. Yep. So things had changed again. And I did talk about these witchcraft trials last episode. Yes. They were brought in in 1735 and basically meant that you couldn't be tried as a witch anymore. That's what these laws were. Mm. So it's called the Witchcraft Act, but it's not a law that makes it a criminal offence to be a witch. Yes. It's the opposite. Yes. So this act kind of marked the end. 
like the official end of the witch hunts and the witch trials that we know mm-hmm. and we've been talking about this whole time that's why we're talking about this story and the law meant nobody could be charged with being a witch when the law was passed in parliament it was basically just a chance for all the intellectuals of parliament to give themselves a big pat on the back for being progressive and intellectual and frightfully clever for not believing <laughs> in this nonsense anymore because who would believe in witches by 1735 well the one man who objected to the law coming in, a Scottish man called Lord James Erskine, and objecting to this law made him look actually insane. <laughs> I just thought it was funny that he was a Scottish man who was like, nope, witches are real. Witches are real. Maybe the Erskine Bridge in Glasgow is named after him. That'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Mm. If by the mid-1700s he was still hunting witches. <laughs> Maybe he needed a big bridge to better get to his witches. Maybe. One thing you'll find interesting Mm -hmm. is that one of the men who brought in this law was the grandson-in-law of Sir Isaac Newton. Very cool. So there you go. Who I believe was also in charge of the Royal Society. At one time, I think, Uh, yes. He was also in charge of the Royal Mint. Yes. Anyway, one part of this new law, the Witchcraft Act of 1735, was that you could be charged for pretending to be a witch. Ah... So you couldn't be charged for being an actual one, but Mm -hmm. if you were pretending and said you had powers that you didn't, you could be criminally charged. Oh, yeah. Do you see where I'm going? Yes. So they decided that witches weren't real anymore, but people pretending to be witches were real, and they had to deal with them somehow. But by 1944, this law hadn't been used in over a hundred (laughs) years. It had been a long time. And it seemed like madness at the time, when the prosecution said that they were going to use this witchcraft law to charge Helen. But the reason behind it seemed to be that if you broke this law, it carried jail time. I was about to say, I assume it's to do with the the punishment. Yes, which was a heavier sentence than you would get through the vagrancy laws. Mm -hmm. So they were basically pushing for this to go through so that she would be put in prison. It's just... I mean, they're probably all sitting there like, we have far more important things to deal with right now. We just need you out of the way for a bit because you're just being a big nuisance and just generally causing harm, but like mental harm and just... It's it's difficult to define. Yeah. So Helen was charged, but the owners of the chemist below Helen's temple were also charged and her agent who like, booked her events and went around the country with her when Henry wasn't well enough to, mm-hmm. she was also arrested. And they were all charged under the witchcraft law. Damn, that's more surprising. Mm-hmm. Especially for like the chemists, because they could have just rented out the room above. Mm-hmm. But they were all charged for trying to break this law of pretending to have power. Now, as you can imagine, the media frenzy around this arrest and this trial was astronomical. It was a circus. And this is where a lot of the misconceptions started because lots of cartoons were released (laughs) with Helen on a broomstick and being a witch. So people believed she was being charged with being a witch. Uh, You could see how it would happen. Mm -hmm. The nature of the law was just lost in translation, Mm -hmm. which is why I wanted to be absolutely plain. That's not what she was charged with. No. Because that would have been illegal by that point. I bet it was the sun. The (laughs) sun... I thought you meant like her son, like her child. I said, that would be awful. No, the The Sun Sun newspaper. newspaper Being like, oh, a person charged with being witch. I mean, I don't think it existed then, but I I know what you're talking about. Bloody tabloids. (laughs) Anyway, her trial lasted seven days. And witnesses were called to either prove that she was a fraud or prove their belief in her abilities. So do you remember Vincent... Uh, the one who got married. Yes. He gave testimony that Helen was completely genuine. He came to court and swore up and down that he had made contact with his dead wife because of Helen. Damn. That's that's why I said I think he genuinely believes what he saw. Yeah. It's almost like what happens now if you get too far into a conspiracy theory. Yes. That you yes. just don't want to look like a massive idiot. By being like, oh, actually, I was completely wrong. I was just being a big moron. Like, nobody wants to do that. You don't put that hat on for the day. I don't even know if he got that far, though. I oh. think he just spent his life believing that his dead wife had given her blessing Maybe. to get remarried. Maybe. 
Anyway, Helen's defence tried to push for her to be allowed to perform a seance in the courtroom. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking that, you know, that would prove that she was genuine. Because if she had a seance in the courtroom and she did the thing, people would believe it and she would be let go. Because she wasn't pretending to be a witch. She genuinely had spiritual powers. Ah, this is where she needs the vanishing cabinet. Exactly. But the judge wouldn't allow it. I mean, I can see why. I can too. I think it would have just been hysteria. Yeah. I feel like I've used that word more this episode than ever. But, you know, it would have just been mayhem if she had done that in a court of law. Actual madness. But one of the problems that the prosecution were having was that there was no proof that the ectoplasm wasn't genuine from the raid that the police carried out. So they had... The investigation before Mm. and everything, but when it came down to it, the police didn't leave with any proof that day that Helen was a fraud. Got you. They've just got proof that she used to use fake ectoplasm. Well, even then, I don't know if they were allowed to use that as proof, because it wasn't... I don't want to say it wasn't an official body. It wasn't a body related to the police that had conducted the investigation. So I don't know if that was allowed as proof basically. So that was one of the issues. They didn't really have anything solid to blame her with. <laughs> you see the problem. Yeah, I see the I see the dilemma. Unfortunately for Helen, it only took the jury 25 minutes to find her guilty of pretending to have spiritual powers. Well, I mean, I'm almost surprised it took that long. Well, it- at least 12 minutes must have been finding the door in and out. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear as well, I don't even think in their wording they said they found her guilty of pretending to be a witch. I don't think that was the phrase. No, no. Um, But she was sentenced to nine months in prison. Nine months? So, like, jail time. Jail time. Actual jail time. Mm -hmm. But she ended up only serving six of these. But when she was released, she was forced to promise and commit to never carry out a seance ever again. I'm assuming she didn't listen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how dare you say that <laughs> oh yeah sure 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 oh you got the chemist do you guys still look for it upstairs same room still got those big curtains <laughs> when she was sentenced the Portsmouth chief of police Arthur Charles West said quote this is a case where not only has she attempted and succeeded in deluding confirmed believers in spiritualism but she has tricked, defrauded, and preyed upon the minds of a certain credulous section of the public who had gone to these meetings in search of a comfort of mind in their sorrow and grief. I can only describe this woman as an unmitigated humbug who can only be regarded as a pest to a certain section of society. That is very apt and very well put. Not to mention the phrase unmitigated humbug. I guess. <laughs> I feel like that doesn't really have the same power that it used to. Yeah. I feel that was quite damning in 1944, but not so now. You just get a bit Scrooge vibes now, don't you? Yeah. Her agent, who mm-hmm. booked her events, was sentenced to four months in prison. Damn. And the couple who owned the chemist uh, below the temple, they received a sentence called being bound over, which I'd never heard of before. No. But if you were bound over you were basically forced to make a promise of good behaviour. Mm. And if you didn't... If you, if you did anything wrong, then you were fined. And the amount was set when you were sentenced. Interesting. I think that's a fair punishment for them. Well, it's very dodgy that they were sentenced just for association, really. Yeah, like, I think that's... But that was that was what they were they were allowed to go. They could mm. carry on as normal, but there were certain things they weren't allowed to do. And if they were caught doing anything bad, then they had to pay that. That's fair. I think it was a five pound fine, which was more in nineteen forty four. Yeah, I suppose that that wouldn't be so bad. But that's fair. I suppose it depends what arrangement they had because they might be taking a cut. Maybe and like advertising it and stuff. I'm really like, not sure. But then that's not illegal, I guess. Well, it would then they're a part of it and they're profiting from it. But. You see, this is the problem, and we're going to, we'll get into this later, mm. but this law hadn't been used in a hundred years. Yeah. So they could be looking at that as, okay, this might not be honest, but it's not illegal. Mm-hmm. 
because it seems unfair that the prosecution used this law. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's fair. Anyway, yeah, I don't know what kind of arrangement they had, but that was their sentence, which mm. I thought was kind of reasonable, I guess. Yeah, I think that's fair for them. <laughs> so that takes them... I don't think they met the war nine months. Well, no, Helen was released in 1945. And her trial had become something of legend. <laughs> but one of the arguments that's put forward, because she was arrested in 1944, I'm pretty sure... Let me double check my research. Bear with, bear with. Aha, yes. So, when was her... I can't find the exact dates. But Helen was arrested and tried in 1944. Before the D-Day landings. (laughs) Now that you might think unrelated seems just kind of coincidental but the d-day landings were planned well in advance and it was a huge operation it was going to require a lot of planning a lot of bravery Mm -hmm. but there was also this paranoia from the people who were planning the d-day landings that if the information got out in any way it wouldn't work and the men would die the whole thing was that it was going to be a surprise and yeah. they were going to storm the beaches, right? Mm-hmm. Then the Navy finds out about this woman who is leaking information that she shouldn't have. Uh oh. I don't think it's outrageous to suggest that they were just battening down the hatches, making sure that no leaks could happen. So it seems like they arrested her for the wrong reasons. Because they arrested her worrying that she might leak information about D-Day if she heard it. Oh, I see, I see. So you're suggesting they made sure she was arrested? Well, yeah, that's what led to the arrest. Oh, yeah, that that would make sense. Because remember I said she'd been doing this for a long time Mm -hmm. and the police only acted on it in 1944. I see... So it's not confirmed or anything. It's no. not a a sure thing, but it is an argument that they saw her as a security threat as part of the war effort. Yeah. So thought, oh, well, there is that argument. But thought if she was in prison until the D-Day landings were over, she wouldn't be able to leak anything. I mean... So they needed the jail time. Yeah, fair enough, I think. Oh. Does it make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I don't think it's too mad to... It's not that much of a reach. No. And I don't even... Because I thought you were going to say they were just like, no, she's a psychic. What if she just intuits this information and leaks it out? We can't have that. Let's discredit her. Oh, no, no, no. Even even that would have been, you know, fair enough to a point that you can laugh about it after after everything. I don't think she would. No, no, she wouldn't. But all friends would be like, you're getting rid of the psychics now. Is that what this has come to? No, no, no. The fact that she had done it before... With information she wasn't supposed to have. Well... Made them worry that... Not that she meant malice by it, but they think that she found out this information and then decided to profit. So if it happened again, she would do the same thing. She would have. Not that she was a spy or anything. No, no. And she would have blown the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. So they were so worried that this operation had to be a success that that's what they did. That's the theory. Crazy. Mm-hmm. So... Like I said, before getting into that theory, Helen was released. Mm -hmm. And Winston Churchill even heard about this trial. (laughs) He was Prime Minister at the time. (laughs) And do you have any guesses about what he had to say about the whole thing? Um, Oh, something suitably witty, I would hope. (laughs) I I just expect him to laugh, really. (laughs) And then just kind of get on with his... I was about to say warmongering. That's entirely the wrong thing. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) I don't know, I'm not going to get into a debate about Churchill. I know there's a lot of problems with him as a person. But he was pretty raging about the whole thing. On her behalf? Well, he thought it was absolutely ludicrous that in Great Britain in 1944, someone could be charged under a witchcraft law. Ah. He was raging that that was just allowed to happen. So Mm. he wrote to the Home Secretary, and this is what he wrote in the memo. 
let me have a report on why the Witchcraft Act 1735 was used in a modern court of justice. (laughs) What was the cost of this trial to the state? Observing that witnesses were brought from Portsmouth and maintained here in this crowded London for a fortnight. And the recorder kept busy with all this obsolete tomfoolery to the detriment of necessary work in the courts. I mean, that's fair. So he was not impressed. He was mad that this had happened. He thought it was just ridiculous. Because it is. It is, it is. He's not wrong. (laughs) That's, yeah, it's it's a more strongly emotional response. But the same thing I was saying, just Mm -hmm. being coarse, being slow. What is this? Why has this happened? What is happening here? Because in my mind, if you can't charge her under a contemporary relevant law, Mm -hmm. you can't charge her. Yeah. Even if she is doing something wrong. It's the same, like, that's the whole court system. If you can't prove it, even if they've done wrong, then you can't charge somebody. Yeah. So it's not an accident that not long after Helen's trial in 1951, the Witchcraft Act was completely repealed. So it didn't, it doesn't exist anymore. And it was replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Ah. So that, that was what someone could be charged under doing what Helen was doing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't imagine that gets used very often either. Well, it, well, it doesn't actually exist anymore. Oh. It was replaced by... Oh, it's a, basically a kind of trading standards law that came in in 2008. Oh. But I haven't got it written down. Yeah. But it's something along that vein. Mm-hmm. But it, it just seemed... The reason that they changed it in the 50s was because charging someone under a witchcraft law in the 20th century just seemed wildly inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. So the campaign to have the law changed was led by a Labour MP who was also a spiritualist. So, you know, they were sort of championing that this law targets us specifically and Mm -hmm. that's not right. So that's part of the reason it was changed. That makes sense. So after everything, Helen moved back to Edinburgh. But unfortunately... When the police raided her home in 1956, Mm -hmm. they discovered her in the middle of a seance. Naturally. So you were completely right. This was a seance. She was not supposed to be performing. (laughs) And I've heard mixed reports from different places and different people saying that the police were overly forceful or that they hurt her in in one story. I don't want to say it was an article because it was more like a, a blog. They said that she left the encounter with burns all over her body but I didn't see that anywhere else so I don't know No. but Helen died five weeks later she wasn't charged after this seance I don't think but she died soon after and from what I could see it's claimed that she had quite a lot of health problems including heart issues that had gotten worse over the years Yeah. so it was natural she wasn't killed or anything Uh, Some of her supporters were and are concerned that the police raided her home in the middle of a seance and interrupted her mid-trance, and that's what eventually killed her. I mean, if it wasn't five weeks later, I feel that would be more believable. So, make of that what you will. Yeah. I, I personally think that she was older and had health complaints. Yeah. But... There are people who don't agree. Naturally, naturally. I also feel like the the police were forceful. They may have been. They may have been totally just one-sided. They were wrong, she wasn't. But with the display she put on when they tried to get her an x-ray, I imagine she was going out of there fighting. (laughs) I suppose, but this is 30 years later. That's true. She had this old woman, "Ah!" whips her rolling pin out of a handbag and starts going to town on them. Crystal ball. Yeah. (laughs) Well... For some reason, after this, after everything with Helen and after her death, she developed this reputation and this moniker of being the last witch in Britain, Hmm. which isn't true in any way. No, because she was, uh, uh, by all the other witchy standards of the other stories and the witchcraft trials, she didn't do any of that. Well, she was not charged with being a witch. That as well. But even the people saying that she was the last person to just be charged under a witchcraft law aren't right because there was a woman not long after her who was similarly charged under the witchcraft law who Mm. was in her 70s and she was the last person. 
but her story didn't take off in the same way. Mm. So she wasn't a witch and she wasn't the last person to be charged under that law. Damn. Shows what a good story will do, though. Yeah. I, I've been trying to figure out where this has all come from and why this has gotten so muddled. But from what I can see, Helen might have been the last person to be jailed under the Witchcraft Act. Oh, yeah. Rather than the last person charged. Mm-hmm. And I think she might have been the last Scottish person to be charged. But I could be wrong there. So it, it's just, I think it's one of those things you see roughly the details and you think you've understood it. Well, you get the essence of the story and then you just kind of make up the story. Mm-hmm. And then the story, the story and the myth will travel faster than the facts and the reality, won't they? Well, if I, if I put this podcast up on YouTube... Mm. with the title medium charged under witchcraft law you would read that and think she had been charged of being a witch yeah so it's it's very misleading you use the word witchcraft and you think of witches exactly exactly so naturally you can see how it's kind of grown arms and legs in recent times there's been a big campaign to pardon helen duncan since a lot of people don't think it was fair that she was prosecuted under a law that should never have been used. Which I agree with. I think it was unfair of them to do that. I don't think that was proper prosecution. I see, I don't disagree. It's just that she got charged because she was causing such a nuisance during a war. I like, guess. Just but charge, her, charge her with whatever. Just get no, her going. <laughs> no, because that's not how the law should work. You can't just charge people you don't like for crimes that you've decided. You can't do that. But then it was... Like, it's a bit silly that it was a, hasn't been used for a hundred years, but if it was still a law and the law that she broke, then... Yes, but that's like one of those stupid laws, like, pregnant women can pee in police hats. It exists purely because nobody's thought to repeal it, yeah. not because it's valid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I get the I get the complaint of wanting to pardon her, but I think pardoning her gives a more, like, martyr and hero status to someone who wasn't a good person. I guess. I, I can don't. see I can see where you're coming from. Because by all accounts, she was a fraud who took advantage of people for money and then worsened things during World War II. Mm. So I think to give her an official pardon is to then put her on this pedestal. I was like, oh, wrongly accused. This was horrible. And then she was a martyr. And I don't think, I don't think she was. Well, I'll get into more of my feelings in that vein in a minute. Yeah, that's fair. Um, what I will say is that with this campaign to pardon her, there's cr- a lot of confusion because a lot of people who have joined the campaign are angry that she was accused of being a witch. <laughs> but she wasn't. That's not what happened. And that's I was talking to you while I was doing my research for this. This mm-hmm. is what I was getting annoyed at, that the people, they don't know what happened. Yeah. Oh. It's so... And it just, I was on so many websites and people talking about it and I just, they didn't, they didn't read it. I've read four headlines about this on Facebook and now I'm pissed. What annoyed me <laughs> was there's a Guardian article from 2007 that oh, gets that. so much wrong and it really annoyed me. Like it said things like how at her trial only allegations of black magic stuck, which isn't true. The whole point was that she was pretending to do these things, not that she was actually doing them. And there's another quote that says, the prosecution and conviction of Helen Duncan as a witch, as a witch, as a witch, was clearly as much of an injustice as those of the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, I just don't agree. I don't agree with that statement. And I have my reasons for not agreeing with that statement. It's not that I think it was fair to charge her under the Witchcraft Act, because I don't think that was fair. I think if they couldn't charge her, like I said, using a reasonable or contemporary law, she shouldn't have been charged. She should have been charged for the appropriate thing and gotten the appropriate sentence. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. People can disagree. That's totally fine. That's just what I think. That's how the law should work. I mean, that's fair. I agree with that. However, her trial and prosecution are in no way similar to the witch hunts and witch trials that we've talked about in the first two episodes no it's just not not to me i don't think they're the same well she wasn't tortured for information she wasn't tortured into admitting things she didn't do that's that's just incorrect it's just it really bothered me 
that someone said these are the same thing. Because they aren't. They categorically aren't. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's fair to equate the two. No. So I just, I wanted to say it because I read it and then it was stuck in my head like a little (laughs) splinter, just making me ratty and it just, it's not the same. No, it's just not. What those women, mostly, but what those people went through who were charged with being witches, which Helen Duncan wasn't, what those people went through was truly, truly horrific. Yeah. There was nothing they could do about it. They didn't do anything wrong. They were just outside the clique of society at the time. That was their only crime. And then they were put to death. They weren't put in jail for six months. So I just... It really bothered me. Mm-hmm. Really, really bothered me. So I had to get that out there. That's just that's not right to me, personally. And I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> oh! <laughs> In 2019, Calendar Community Council actually floated the idea of naming a new housing development Duncan Drive in her honour because she was born there. You're shaking your head already. Well, because what are you honouring about her? <laughs> What is there to honour? I don't think I've ever seen you get so annoyed. Oh, it's just... In an in a episode, at least. Yeah. What is there to honour? Oh, she was a hero. How? What did she do? <laughs> One of Helen's granddaughters lives... I don't know if she has more granddaughters, but this particular granddaughter called Margaret lives in Tennessee. Hmm. And she says she would support the move. This was in 2019. As long as the council were doing it to recognise her grandmother's work as a medium and not to recognise her for witchcraft. Fair. Well, I don't know what to make of that, because I don't believe... I believe if she was a genuine medium, that wasn't what she was doing in seances. You know? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know why you would honour someone for what she did publicly. Does that make sense? Yeah. She may have been a genuine medium, but that isn't what she was putting across by the cloth and the masks and everything. And the ectoplasm. Yeah, you know? Yeah. So I struggle with that. No. I don't really know what to make of that. I mean, presumably she believes her. Well, I was going to make that point that Margaret was raised believing that her grandmother's gifts were a gift from God. Mm -hmm. The family genuinely believed she was a medium. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously very important to their family. Yeah. I would never want to criticise someone for wanting to honour your family's legacy. If it's something that is important to you, you you know, you you can't... You can never tell someone that. And presumably they believe that it was all faked, all the evidence and everything. Presumably, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, everything against Helen was for yeah. Yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, like you, you have to wonder. But Margaret also said that, quote, she will continue to work on Helen's legacy as a wonderful medium. And her dream is to have a memorial erected in Helen's honour in Calendar. That's what she wants. It's good to dream big. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard you being more sarcastic in your life. <laughs> I just don't know. I don't know what to make of how margaret feels i mean that's fair because she said that she was only 18 months old when her when helen died so mm-hmm. she doesn't really remember her but she feels like she has this connection to her and wants to honor her as being a genuine medium so i, I don't not believe her i believe that's what she wants well i i believe that that's what she believes in yeah but i don't From what I've been able to see, I don't believe that what Helen was selling was being a genuine medium. No. I'm trying to say it carefully, because I don't want to be mean. I'm being mean, so that balances it. (laughs) Well, you know, I I don't want to be horrible, Mm -hmm. because it's obviously important to her. But from what I have been able to see and witness, I just don't feel the same way. But she's not my granny. No. But that, all of that, is the story of Helen Duncan, the incorrectly labelled Last Witch of Britain. That was a wild ride. (laughs) What do you think? Oh my god. (laughs) I don't even know what to think. I'm just raging like, she was such a hero. She was 
so mistreated. Like, why? There are people much worse treated than that, with much graver circumstances. She had to go to jail for six months. Oh, all right. Could be worse. <laughs> it's just, it's such a bizarre story. Uh, yeah, yeah. I really wasn't kidding at the top when I said that this is beyond strange. It really was, all the way through. And then even the fact that she was tra- charged charged with witchcraft. No, she wasn't. Uh, charged under a witchcraft <laughs> law. See, that's how it happens. <laughs> that's how it happens. Oh my days, it's already begun. Oh. Well, yeah, even that in itself. If you didn't know anything before, hmm. that itself would be like, wow, that's insane. That is insane. But then hearing everything that she did, like, oh, it just... I was completely hooked on the story. And that's why I've been desperate to tell it to you, because I want to talk about it. Yeah, that was intense. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to say before people start tuning out and ending the series, Mm. what I want to say is that now that all three episodes are finished, Mm -hmm. that what we've talked about in these three episodes is not a representation of what witchcraft is in the modern day. It's something completely different to everything that we've talked about. And generally the people who practice witchcraft that I've seen online, they're the most welcoming and inclusive and caring people that I've met. Mm. They're lovely. And they have such a unique connection to the world and themselves and their sense of self that this is more a mini-series about the history of witch trials, not witchcraft. It's fair. If that makes sense. That makes sense. I just wanted to say that. Mm. I thought it was important that the two are different things yeah. in my head. This isn't a representation of what that is in the modern day. So I just wanted to say before people left. <laughs> <laughs> As a final hurrah. Mm-hmm. And I will say, feel free to be a medium or be a witch and do you. Just don't be a fraud and trick people. I think that's a fair statement to ask. Don't cheat people. Yeah. It's not nice. What do you think of the miniseries generally? I thoroughly enjoyed it. We've arrived at the end. We have come to the end. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you're listening to this on Friday, the... uh, What's next Friday? Is it the 20th? No. 20th? 20-something? For us, it's next Friday. This is Monday. Then I'm glad, because it means I've managed to edit all three episodes this week. (laughs) (laughs) I've got your work out for you now. And if you enjoyed it, please... Leave us a review. Yeah, that would mean the world. On Apple Podcasts, if you have an Apple device. Especially as we're approaching the season two release. We are. So any ratings, reviews, comments, follows, mm-hmm. they really make a difference. Especially because we're still in our infancy. We're still quite small. And social media is hard. Yeah, it is. It's really it is. hard. So come check us out on Instagram, at Generally Spooky. Yeah, that's probably where we're most active so if you want news about the podcast that's where you'll find it Mm -hmm. um do we do we have a release date for season two or anything no no nothing season two will be coming later this year yes towards probably september september maybe october we'll see how we go (laughs) i can't remember september or october season two will be coming soon we are very excited yeah, and we excited. can't wait to talk to you some more about yeah. some spooky stories. And we hope you enjoyed the mini series. Yeah, I hope that this little series has tided you over until until we get to talk to you again. Until our return. <laughs> so we will see you in season two. Yep. Thank you for listening. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs>